if you talk to infectious disease experts and epidemiologists, and indeed, if you talk to historians, the overall perception in the field was that it was just a matter of time. The question is, what bug is it that will cause this problem? We have bacteria. They don't evolve very quickly. We have a good understanding of how they're transmitted and we have antibiotics for them. People generally thought bacteria are not going to cause a global pandemic. Protozoal infections, things like malaria, those are really very much based in places that are the right climate. So as long as you can contain that, it's not going to be a problem. And so when you look at sort of where people's focus was, it was really on the viruses. People understood the viruses are probably going to be where we have a problem from. And then if you question which kind of viruses, most people did indeed think that the, the next big pandemic would be an influenza pandemic. Coronavirus wasn't really an imminent threat in the way that influenza is. Having recognized this threat, there is obviously going to be far more effort to find both a vaccine that works and, of course, uh, drugs to fight the disease. If we look at the influenza vaccine, we know how difficult it is to do this. In the time of the outbreak of the 1918 influenza, there was really very little that a doctor could do. We have sort of three mainstays of treatment. You had whiskey, you had enemas, and you had bloodletting. There are examples, many examples, from across the world actually, where people had their bloodlet uh, as a way to treat influenza. They would take a knife or a, or a tube insert it into a vein and remove your blood, uh, and it was thought to cure you. When you remove some blood from somebody who is very sick, um, you make them lightheaded and faint, and they tend to sort of pass out. And this was misinterpreted back then as a sign that, oh, he's calm, you know, he's, in, he's sleeping. During the epidemic, aspirin was widely used, uh, but nobody really understood at that time what happens when you take too much aspirin? And I've treated aspirin overdoses as an emergency physician. What happens in severe aspirin overdoses is you get fluids pouring into the lungs, making breathing difficult, which actually mimics the symptoms of the flu. Because so much aspirin was being prescribed uh, at the time uh, in very large doses, it may be that um, some of the people who died during the pandemic died as a result of highly toxic uh, aspirin overdoses rather than the influenza itself. Uh, and this is a very unsettling thought. But at the time, they didn't know better. I think it was a very genuine attempt to deal with the, with the outbreaks, with the best science that they had of the day. There was a great amount uh, that they were completely misguided and wrong about. There are some differences between aspirin and chloroquine. I mean, we, we, we knew back in uh, 1918 that aspirin uh, does treat the symptoms of fever, that is clear. We just didn't know the dose. Uh, the question about chloroquine is still out. We don't know at all whether or not it treats anything to do with any of the symptoms of COVID. We still don't know whether hydroxychloroquine is going to work. We have to wait for the uh, evidence uh, based on the good clinical trials. The research laboratories at Brentford are working all out, hoping to have enough vaccine by the middle of next month to make it available all over the country. It's said to give protection for about a year. Last spring, scientists decided that this winter's vaccine should be against the A. Beijing strain of flu virus. Vaccination is about 80% effective, and researchers here at the London Hospital have carried out tests showing the vaccine should work this winter. If there is going to be a true flu epidemic, it surely must provide better protection than people who are unvaccinated. We have to make a vaccine that targets the part of the coronavirus that has to remain stable, uh, knowing that the other bits of the, of the coronavirus um, can, uh, can change. And we haven't yet done that. Well, let's start with a simple vaccine like measles. We only have to give that a couple of times as children and we're essentially immune for life. Now, why is it that we have to get an influenza vaccine year to year to year. If you have a vaccine that gets your immune system to recognize the outer coat of, the, of, of a certain type of influenza, your immune system is only good at that type of influenza. 
And should another strain come along, your immune system can't recognize it. Now, when we talk about coronavirus, we have exactly the same scenario as the influenza vaccine. And nobody really knows if we'll be able to do it. There are lots of questions about how the uh, vaccine will work. And we'll only know the answers to those important questions when we do the clinical trials. This has been a learning cycle for everybody. Sometimes scientists seem to be doing work in fairly obscure areas. You could imagine a, a bench researcher working in her lab, um, examining coronavirus and perhaps getting some government grants for a couple of million dollars here or there. And people might sort of scratch their heads at, at the time and say, well, why, why is this researcher getting this money? Uh, and then of course, at the end of the day, it turns out that this research um, was actually uh, very important. We have to maintain our vigilance and continue to do all kinds of basic and clinical research. The other important lesson I think for all of us is to recognize our own vulnerabilities. We know from uh, what happened back in 1918 that um, it is entirely possible for people to be quarantined, distant from other people, social distancing. And then when they come back out together, there could be a second wave. We had the outbreak of the disease first noted in the US in January and February of, of 1918. Around spring and early summer of, of, of 1918, the British Medical Journal said, well, that's it, we're done, no more influenza. People were no longer quarantined in the way that they had been the virus came back. It tore through some cities. Now, that was probably a result of two things. Uh, not only the fact that people um, were uh, not, uh, were no longer uh, quarantined, also because influenza is a seasonal virus. And the big question that we have now is, will there be a coronavirus season? Uh, but nobody really knows what will happen. This is a very, um, really an open question. Um, but we do have to be very cautious, I think, uh, as we think about um, what the ne next steps are. We are not invincible, despite all the amazing things that, that science and modern medicine can do. Disease, wh whether it's viruses, uh, bacterial infections, they all have a potential to harm us in a very serious way.